Our next speaker is Warren Mundine, and Warren is going to uh, talk about human capital in particular, harnessing the potential in Indigenous Australian communities. Warren. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for that, Kerry. Uh, first of all, I'd uh, for, uh, give an apology for, to people who uh, heard that Mundine was speaking today. I just wanted to make sure that everyone knew that... Um, uh, going to work now, that uh, I'm Warren Mundine, not Anthony Mundine anyway, <laughs> even though some people get confused in regard to, uh, to our very similar athletic frame. Uh, okay, and so also I'd like to acknowledge that, uh, the, uh, that we are in the land of the uh, indigenous, uh, tropical Indigenous people. As you can see, look at him, look, that's, that's actually a photo of me. The, uh, and acknowledge the, uh, the lands of the uh, tropical Indigenous people here of the, of the north. I'm delighted to be here today at this important conference on the future of tropical uh, economies, which builds on the, on the State of the Tropics report released a little, uh, a little over two months ago. I'd like to thank James uh, Cook University and the Cairns Regional Council for hosting, hosting this event and for inviting me to speak today on the, on the subject of human capital utilising our greatest asset. And just following on from your comments as well, Professor. Human capital is the value that people provide through their skills, knowledge and experiences. It's a critical factor in the future of tropical economies because the population of the tropics globally is large and growing. Currently, 40% of the world's population lives in the tropics, and this is predicted to rise to 50% by 2050. Of course, we have a very different situation here in Northern Australia, which is Australia's piece of the tropics. Only 4% of Australia's population live in Northern Australia. That's about a million people. It's a number that barely registers when looking at the population of the tropics as a whole. This small population is sparsely spread over 3 million square kilometres. The State of the Tropics report identifies a number of other important differences between Northern Australia in other tropical economies. Northern Australia has a higher GDP per capita, higher adult and children uh, literacy and higher average means of schooling than any other tr tropical economies. And where where's nearly 30% of people in the tropics overall living in, uh, uh, are living in extreme poverty, which is defined as living on $1.25 per day, not even the poorest people in Australia are anywhere near extreme poverty. Australia has a generous welfare safety net and is a modern developed nation. All this presents a very interesting set of challenges and opportunities for growing Australia's tropi tropical economies, which, this federal gov which the federal government is committed to doing. Because of its low population and lack of infrastructure outside of a few major population centres, most of Northern Australia is undeveloped and certainly less developed than other tropical economies. I just come from, uh, from North East Darnley and I can really uh, attest to that. However, it is part of one of the most developed economies in the world and by comparisons with other tropical economies, the standard of living there is high. One of the, one of the re reasons emerging economies of the world experience rapid economic growth is because people are poor wages and the cost of living are low, and there is limited welfare or public assistance for people in poverty. This creates intense, even desperate, drive. Often these economies are almost, are almost le much less regulated than the developed world. We have the opposite conditions in Northern Australia. Earlier this month, the Joint Select Committee in Northern Australia released its final report following its inquiry in the developer in Northern Australia. The Parliamentary Committee's report will inform the Federal Government's White Paper on Developing Northern Australia, which will set out the Government's vision for the future of Northern Australia and a policy for its development. There are some, some good thinking and an analyst, analyst in, the, in the Committee's report. However, I don't know whether to laugh or cry when I read the uh, Committee's number one recommendation and that the Australian Government should create a new Department of Northern Australia, Northern Australia Development. Governments and public servants don't generate economic growth or prosperity. They don't create jobs and they don't start businesses. 
private capital investment and commerce do that? If the government seriously wants to develop Northern Australia, then creating a big fat new bureaucracy is not going to help. If anything, it will make things worse. Governments can't develop Australia's north. Governments can only create the environment that will foster the flow of capital into Northern Australia and provide the conditions that encourage investment. Government has already taken major steps to create these conditions by signing free trade agreements with Korea and Japan earlier this year. And it seems likely Australia will also secure a free trade agreement with China in the near future. These are substantial achievements for our country and, and achievements only governments can deliver. Northern Australia sits on the doorstep of, of the fastest growing and most populate, highly populated region in the world and it has vast tracts of undeveloped land and sea, abundance in natural resources. There are sustainable opportunity, substantial opportunities for Northern Australia, particularly in the pastoral, mining and agricultural industries. There is also the, the secondary industries that flow from these developments, like roads, wharfs, electricity grids, ports and other facilities, and the utilities and technology infrastructure needed to operate those facilities. Its vast geography has great unlocked potential. The committee's report also identified a number of impediments to development in Northern Australia, including low population, a lack of infrastructure, high cost of living and utilities, and the regulatory environment, particularly green tape. All these are examples of not having the right conditions for, in for investment. For example, to, re to realise the potential of Northern Australia, we need a regulatory approval framework that embraces agility and entrepreneurships, provides certainty and predictability for people wanting to do business and is not ridiculously expensive. We don't just need this in Northern Australia, we need it everywhere. But today I'm talking about human capital. Having a skilled, educated, job-ready workforce on the ground is essential if government wants companies to invest in Northern Australia. One of the recurring themes in the committee's report is the need to increase the population of Northern Australia. There are complications and limitations relying on, as mentioned earlier, fly-in, fly-out or drive-in, drive-out workforces, which the report identifies. Development projects in Northern Australia will need local populations that are job-ready and educated. The committee's report uh, observed one of the major constraints that we face is building, in building our northern population. Australia must, must find ways to build its population in the tropical north, not only to attract people, but also to retain them. That is absolutely critical. There are great opportunities available in northern Australia, but we need more people living and working in the north to be able to realise these opportunities. I find this observation uh, really interesting. Here is a major parliamentary inquiry talking about how we must work out how to encourage people to go and live in the north because we don't have enough people living there. Yet when people talk about remote indigenous communities in, in northern Australia, we, all, we often hear the very opposite, that there are no jobs or opportunities in these areas, the communities should be closed and the people there should be moved to southern popula population centres. How can there be a shortage of labour in Northern Australia on the one hand and a shortage of jobs on the other? Indigenous communities should be the first port of call to meet the demands for labour in Northern Australia. To me, there, this is a no-brainer. By 2040, which is about 25 years away, it's estimated that half of Northern Australia's population will be Indigenous. Indigenous communities are younger, growing faster than the rest of the Australian population. The population pyramid for, for Australia as a whole looks like, looks like most developed countries with an ageing population and the largest distribution of population in the 30 to 55 age groups. The population pyramid for Australia's Indigenous population is shaped the, like the population pyramid of developing countries like Ghana or India, white at the bottom, younger age group and tapering off at the, at the top older age groups. I always use the term that while the rest of Australia is getting older, greyer and grumpier, Indigenous people are getting younger and sexier. <laughs> people, people for Indigenous communities in Northern Australia don't need encouragement or tax incentives or anything else as an indictment, inducement, I mean, to live there. They want to live there. 
In fact, they fought for hundreds of years to stay on their lands. Here is a source of a human capital in Northern Australia right under our nose. So why is it been, being ignored? Because most Indigenous Australians in Northern, Northern Australia today do not participate in the real economy and many are not job ready. I mentioned before the statistics for Northern Australia compared to other tropical economies. These statistics obscure some important data. The gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians in things like employment, education and health. Northern Australia may have a relative high GDP per capita, but many Indigenous people of Northern Australia don't partake in it. Northern Australians overall may have higher literacy and higher average means of years of schooling, but many Indigenous people in the region do not. In fact, as we all know, many Indigenous children in remote and regional Australia are not even attending school. The generosity of Australia's welfare system and the absence of extreme poverty in many ways place Northern Australia at a disadvantage compared to other tropical regions and emerging economies. Welfare in Australia has gone from being a temporary measure to get people who had fallen on hard times back, back on their feet to bring to being accepted as a way of life in some, in some circles. That is certainly what is happening in remote Indigenous communities. I call it state-sponsored poverty. Generations of families have become trapped in the welfare safety net. The solution to all of this is not a mystery. It involves getting Indigenous children educated and Indigenous adults into a job. I've spoken and written extensively on how to move people from welfare to work for case manage intensive training that addresses all the barriers to employment. And you can find links to these speeches and articles on my website. This afternoon, I'd like to focus on the education of children in remote and regional Indigenous communities and my thoughts on how education can and should be provided in those areas. If the governments of Australia, Queensland, Northern Territory and Western Australia are serious about the development of Northern Australia, then they need to focus very seriously on Indigenous education and take proper steps to deliver first-class education to children in remote communities. The education of children doesn't start when they turn five. As the Forest Review highlighted, the important area of zero to four years in primary and primary school. I agree with the Forest Review's approach of starting in the womb. In Indigenous education initiatives, there has been a lack of focus in zero to four and primary, primary school levels compared to secondary and tertiary education. Programs will need, need to be able to penetrate deeply into Indigenous communities at the secondary and tertiary level if these students have not complete, uh, have not completed primary education to a sat satisfactory level. For primary school, the first imperative is that every Indigenous child has access to a fully resourced primary school with full-time teachers who live in the community where the school is located. Currently, access to a fully staffed primary school is, is a problem in small remote areas. For example, some communities have homeland, homeland learning centres where unqualified teaching assistants are employed from the community to operate the school day to day and qualified teachers visit periodically. Any facilities that does not have full-time teachers is ineffective and a waste of money. These types of facilities create an illusion that children are being educated when they are not. It would be better to have no education facilities at all. That would at least force education departments to confront the challenges of how to generally educate these children. In remote areas, one primary school can serve as several indig uh, neighbouring Indigenous communities in the area with, with transport provided to collect and return children each day. Distance travel is an accepted part of life in remote parts of Australia. In remote communities, one primary school should be de designated to serve as all communities within, say, an hour's drive. School transport should be provided to collect the children each morning and return them at the end of the, each day. I have visited communities and places where there is a fully staffed primary school in one community and homeland learning centres in communities sometimes less than an hour's drive away. Each of these homeland le learning centres costs centers cost money to build, maintain and operate. Costs that could be re redirected to transporting children to a regional primary school. 
A regional primary school approach is also, also creates jobs for drivers of school transport. People in the community should be hired in these jobs. Secondly, focused remedial intervention needs to be provided in schools with poor NAPLAN test results or poor attendance records. Many schools servicing Indigenous communities are not capable of delivering an effective education to, to children, even if they, are all, if they all start coming to school every day. Some schools are not, a, are not equipped to teach all the children in the community. For example, I've visited schools that are resourced for the, for the few children that come to school, but not all the children who should be there. They don't have enough chairs and desks for every child in the community and, and the resources for the teachers. Staff and Territory Government Departments should be required to develop a plan for ordering order current resources and, and, cap and capabilities and a plan for resourcing schools in these communities to teach all children in that community effectively. In communities with a long history of truancy and poor schooling, schools will struggle to provide quality education and outcomes to students, most of whom will be well behind the level they should be at, and all at different levels. These department plans therefore also need to include a plan for remedial education and working with children to enable them to catch up. Thirdly, the standard expected of teachers in schools in remote Indigenous communities, and we could also apply this across the board in regard to all communities in the North, should be higher than for regular, uh, regular schools. Disadvantaged communities need the, the best teachers. Children in these communities are behind in their learning and may have never received any real education to speak of. Illiteracy and numeracy rates are high, and most children come from homes where the adults have not been educated themselves. This requires teachers who are highly skilled. All teachers who teach in schools where a significant proportion of students speak an Aboriginal language at home should also complete appropriate training in teaching English as a second language. As an incentive to the best teachers, governments could offer scholarships which waive, waiver or reduce university fees for tertiary students who commit to, to completing, say, a four-year placement in an Indigenous school and who achieve a distinction average in their courses in their, in their course studies. Any such placements should be immediately after should not be immediately after graduation. It is better that the teachers get experience teaching before teaching in a remote community. It should also be a clear expectation for all remote Indigenous teaching, teaching posts that teachers be willing to become part of the community, get to know the locals, participate in the community events and activities, make friends, go fishing, coach the kids at sport on weekends and so on. Teachers who are disengaged from community, and I've seen this in many communities across Australia, or complain if the children turn up because it increases their workloads, should be transferred out. Teachers who don't have the, the right attitude should not be employed to, edu to educate Indigenous children. I was highly critical of the decisions of the Northern Territory teachers uh, to go on strike at the beginning of this school year after I, after I heard that one of the justifications for striking was an increased attendance at school arising from the government's truancy push. This is the wrong attitude. When it comes to secondary education, I believe some differences in approach is required. Effective secondary education requires a, a depth of teaching expertise across a range of subjects. It cannot be delivered, be delivered on site in small communities. The best approach is there for all secondary students to have access to a regional boarding school that offer wide weekly boarding facilities. While some secondary students have the opportunity and desire to attend boarding schools in major cities or, or regional centres, this is not available or suitable for everyone. Enabling students to board on a weekly basis and whilst remaining in or near their own communities will give more students access to the secondary education smorgasbord of, of, of subjects they need to be successful. In remote areas, one secondary boarding school could serve as communities within, say, a two or three hour drive. School transport should be provided to transport students home for the weekends. Jobs would be created driving school transport and for home parents in boarding facilities and people from the community should be hired in these jobs. This creates jobs for community members and appropriate support for students while living away from home. 
Focus remedial intervention also needs to be provided for secondary students who have not had an eff effective primary education. For some secondary students, it may, it, so secondary, it may be better to, to address illiteracy in, nu in, in, in numeracy in the same way as adults' illiteracy in, nu in numeracy and focus on job readiness and job training rather than remedial schooling. However, secondary students should not be written off and should have the opportunity to complete their schooling with remedial intervention opportunities. Finally, I strongly support fostering a partnership approach where re remote schools, primary and secondary, partner with high-performing schools or universities in major Australian cities like Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, Brisbane and so on. This presents a range of possibilities. Teacher exchanges is one example. Another possibility is to have classrooms in remote uh, schools Skype in to participate in lessons being held in partner schools. The only limit is imagination. For the city schools and university partnerships provide obvious benefits to students and teachers having an opportunity for deep engagement with remote indigenous communities. This brings, which this brings me to another observation. Internet, internet connectability is perhaps the most effective infrastructure that can be delivered in remote communities. It opens up a raft of possibilities for supplementing and enriching education and experience of children in remote areas, and it's not hard, and it's not hard to deliver. I have been in communities where sometimes as, something as basic as a mobile phone tower has opened the community up to the whole world. I believe that the approach I've just outlined is an effective blueprint for in, in educating Indigenous children in remote communities. But I also believe this approach will help meet the unmet demand for human capital in Northern Australia. Ensuring the education of Indigenous children will do far more for the development of Northern Australia than a Department of Northern Australian Development. It is not just governments that can make a difference here. Companies who are looking to invest in Northern Australia also have a part to play. Any company who is looking to invest in projects or develop in Northern Australia should be considering what steps they can take to ensure they have access to a local educated workforce in the future. This is something that large corporations already do in other tropical economies, so why not in Northern Australia? I'll give you an example. BHP Billiton is the principal investor and operator of an aluminium smelter in, in Moselle in Mozambique. This project provides 55% of Mozambique's exports. Some years ago, BHP Bulletin identified that the problem of malaria infection in Mosul was costing its business for reduced productivity, company medical costs, and cost of replacement, recruitment, and training, and other things. So it invested in developing highly successful anti-malaria programs in Mosul, which reduced adult malaria infections from 90% of the adult population to below 10%. It also invested heavily in primary school programs in Mosul. The project life cycle of the aluminium smelter was in the order of 50 years. Investing in primary school education would provide BHP Billiton with a better educated second generation workforce. Many mining companies in Australia make substantial contributions towards economic and community development in remote indigenous communities where they do their business. But that, that but this is not just about corporate social responsibility, about doing the right thing, or about providing something in return for access to the land. It is also a business imperative. What I say to companies who are involved in or plan major projects in remote Northern Australia is this. I should be finishing the thing. What are you doing about ensuring you have an educated local, local talent pool in 10, 15 or 20 years? If the, if the local schools are not producing people you can hire, what are you doing to address, to address this problem? Have you engaged with community uh, leaders and parents about how you can help the community establish schools and remedial schooling to educate the population? Companies need to be thinking decades ahead and looking at the number of projects for its life cycle. Today's children are tomorrow's workforce and many children in the areas you are going to be doing business in, in uh, not getting educated in the way we need the, your future workforce to be. I'll leave it at that. Uh, there's a lot more, but I'll, uh, my um, speech for today will be going up on the website this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks very much, Warren.